And Patrick Rhodes, we gave a great talk today on uh, the creation of Ford Canada. Am I correct with that? Yes, you are. All right. Thank you. I'm really excited to hear the talk, and thank you so much for coming. And remember, after the talk, there'll be refreshments, there's coffee, and there's some cake. I think some people might have brought donuts, too. Uh, thank you for everyone who brought stuff in. And then we'll have a meeting. So, Nairene's the boss after that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I feel like Joe Biden coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course we miss Craig and hope uh, hope he's feeling better. We'll all miss his infectious personality, but I'm gonna tell him that. That's a bad way to be. Matt, make sure you report. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Some of you may remember about two months ago there was an editorial in the Windsor Star about the sorry state of local history in Windsor and how you just couldn't find information with regard to the, the nuts and bolts about how this community was put together. There was nothing there about the, the sewer system and the roads and how the infrastructure of our city came into being. There was a Professor John Brown, who, John Lloyd Brown John, who wrote this and about what an absence we have. He mentioned writers by the name of uh, Marty Gervais, who have never covered such things. And what a, what a sad state it was. And he phoned the planning department of the city of Windsor to find out what was going on. What was the answer to these questions about where do our sewers and roads and infrastructure come from? And they never responded. Um, city of Windsor planning department, of course, handles the zoning and development matters in the city of Windsor. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the history. So I'm not sure exactly why he phoned them, or he might as well have called the fire department, I guess. <laughs> uh, in any event, he seemed to be unaware of the fact that there is this book out there. It has been for some time. Uh -huh. I read that. Kudos to you. <laughs> About Windsor from 1900 to 1945. And if he had read it, which you apparently have not, by the nature of that editorial, he would have found out that in 1900, Mayor John Davis of Windsor initiated a plan to macadamize the roads of the central part of the city of downtown, which is basically all of Windsor was in 1900. At the time he became mayor, they were just simply mud tracks. And he provided the latest form of mac macadamized roads for our city in the four years beginning in 1900. That was, that was done. And in the 1920s, when the city had expanded significantly as a result of Fort of Canada and the development of industry in the city, there was another program, a very expensive one, to <coughs> concrete and asphalt the streets of the city of Windsor. And this was done to provide the, the main wide streets that we, some of the main streets that we have. If you look at Olette Avenue, you see that it's an exceptionally wide right of way because it not only supported traffic on either side, it also supported two sets of railway cars going north and south. So that's one reason why it's so wide, and it was paved that way throughout the early 1920s. And when you, you look at Parent Avenue as well, you'll notice the Parent is so wide, <coughs> because going from Erie Street to Tecumseh Road, it was as well a, a street railway car rate, so it had to pr provide room for both cars and trains. So all that was covered in the book, going up to the fact that our highway system effectively bankrupted the city of Windsor in the 1930s. Um, so the information is, to his dismay, already there if you pick up the book and read it. And as far as the sewers go, there's a, quite a story there as well. Much of it has to go with the fact of our, our water system in the city which uh, I've dealt with in some detail, because in the 19th century, water in the city was very polluted to the extent that by the early 1900s, it was practically toxic to drink uh, city water. Every year there could be outbreaks of diphtheria, <coughs> and typhus, and people would die. Um, 
regularly we'd have 10 to 20 deaths every year in Windsor, which was not a large place, just from people drinking the water. It was not until, 19, until 1912 when chlorination was introduced, surreptitiously, nobody made any announcements, it was all done on the secret, because people would complain about, the city's putting things into my water, how dare they? But all of a sudden diphtheria and typhus stopped, and you could actually drink the water and not put your life in your hands. And in the early 1920s, there was the production to build the uh, water treatment plants on Stravain Avenue, which we kind of drive by, I mean, I do all the time, and you look at the entire infrastructure on Stravain and don't pay any attention to it. And we have to think that it's been there for one year, treating our water and ensuring that people in Windsor and LaSalle, for that matter, have safe, safe water to drink. And all of that is detailed in some of uh, the specifics in this book, as well as the fact that part of going in conjunction with that was the utility system to handle sewage. And this will tie into eventually to our Mr. McGregor. In 1917, the province of Ontario was really totally frustrated with Windsor under its inability to handle any kind of infrastructure with the various communities. You had Windsor, you had Walker, Sandwich, you had Fort City. None of them could agree on much of anything. So in 1917, the province stepped in and said, that's it. There is going to be one utilities commission for this entire metro area, the Essex Border Utility Commission. And that commission looked at the entire situation and said, it's got to stop. A main trunk sewer was built going from Pelec Road to Pearland. And the 11 sewers that in all of the border cities were issuing effluent directly into the Detroit River at that point, right in front of the water intake plants. It's, it's unfortunate to say, but that was the case back then. Were all stopped and put into the trunk sewer, which discharged its load way below the actual intake for our water. But it took this central committee to come in and do that for us. And as I say that, um, I find it kind of disquieting when I read things like that in the Windsor Star and realize that if you picked up a book and read about it, you would know, instead of forming the planning department. <laughs> now, with regard to Gordon McGregor, um, I've always found him to be quite an interesting figure. And in my mind, the central figure towards the creation of the city of Windsor, I can't think of anybody else who really um, has taken such a central role in making this community in which we live. Which is odd because he had a, a very, well, fairly usual relation, upbringing for a rather well-to-do young man in the, early, in the late 1800s. He was born in Windsor in 1873, and his father was a very go-getting businessman, was involved in a lot of small businesses, some of which made money and some of which didn't. A lot of it, kind of ironically enough, was the livery business, uh, buying and selling horses. And he bought and sold horses for the uh, United States during the Civil War, and was making a living out of that, and basically anything else he could think of to make a buck out of it. His father, William, was very active in politics as a liberal, so his young son, Gordon, was exposed to all that, both in the business sense and uh, in politics as well. But nobody really put a lot of stock in Gordon. He was a very pleasant young man, um, socialized in the community in Windsor, um, would attend the various sporting events and so on and everything. And, um, kind of a good, pleasant guy to know. He had a nice voice. They called it a baritone voice. He used to sing at the Presbyterian Church at St. Andrews and uh, anywhere else where he was called on, they would ask, Gordon to grind out a tune. Very pleasant, pleasant young man. And nobody thought that he was really going to go much of anywhere, really. Uh, nice guy. Yeah. 1890s, he was active in Detroit. He got a job at a, at a uh, haberdashery selling men's clothes. 
and he had a natural flair for sales. He liked people. He could interact well. Um, if you wanted to sell collars and cuffs, Gordon was your guy to go to. And he'd fix you up, fix you up very nicely. Met a nice young lady in Detroit by the name of Hattie Dodds. Married her in the 1890s. And started a family. Once again, doing okay in business. Uh, not doing all that well. His father, William, his business had been kind of up and down. And in the 1890s, he had survived one depression. He'd pretty well gone broke at one point. Came back again. And by the 1890s, was investing in a bunch of businesses he thought might go somewhere. And one of them he got together with um, his banker friend, John Curry. You know, Curry Street downtown. Um, John Curry was the banker. And he was a good friend of the McGregor family. And of course, having a banker for a friend wasn't such a bad idea when you needed loans. John Milner, who was a, an Englishman, had moved to Windsor and actually owned a, some of the old buildings you see on Walker Road by Wyandotte Street. There's a, there's a stretch of kind of townhouses put together, uh, very old buildings built in the early 1890s. Um, and John Milner was the owner of one or two of those townhouses. He'd come to the attention of Hiram Walker. And in the 1890s, Hiram Walker was reaching the, the end of his uh, career, the end of his life for that matter. But he was always looking for something new to do. And I always found it striking about Hiram Walker that he would branch out into different areas into providing his own um, supply for making whiskey his own cornfields, uh, his own livestock, uh, farming and agriculture. He would have all these side businesses going on. And he was one of those guys that always seemed to make money. You talk about Hiram Walker. He never missed a chance to try and do something, and it always seemed to work. And by the late 1890s, he got the idea of saying, well, why don't I have my own factory to be making carts and things to haul? I've got a lot of projects and things. I should be making my own carts. I could make money that way too. So he bought some land next to Walkerville, actually in the township of Sam Cheese. And together with this Englishman, John Milner, they got together with the Milner Walker <coughs> cart making business. And they had a little stand out there on, on what is now Riverside Drive. And there was some success about 1898 going on. And they were doing okay. And they were getting a lot of orders into the carts, and sleighs even. But it wasn't doing too well. Hiram Walker died about 1898. And the magic went out of the business. Milner didn't seem to be able to take it on too well. So they sold out. And Curry bought it with McGregor. And McGregor said, I've got to give young Gordon a shot. So he put him in charge of running the carriage works. So this was Gordon's first chance to run a, a real business by himself. So he took it over and started running it, and it just kind of really went into the ground. He couldn't seem to make a go of it. They, they had some requests for uh, wagons. They couldn't seem to fill them properly. They had about 100 guys working in the, the cart factory, but it just wasn't going too well. By 1902, it was kind of falling apart financially. They were moving a lot of the production material out to West Lauren. And by about the end of 1902, they stopped production. They just said, we just, we just can't make a go of it. It was going bust. So this was pretty deflating to Gordon McGregor. And he didn't know quite what to do. So, but as I say, he was a very gregarious fellow. He knew everybody. And he would sit around with the guys he knew in Windsor saying, what do you think I could, I could do with all this? <coughs> so, he knew a bunch of guys like Fred Evans in Windsor, who was the bicycle king locally. Fred Evans was a, a great machinist, <coughs> and people in Windsor now were making a lot of bicycles, a lot of machinery, and so this was not foreign ground to them. They were aware of these things called automobiles. One or two people in Windsor actually owned some. And uh, 
the name escapes me at the moment, but there was a, a sales group in Windsor who were actually selling American automobiles in Windsor. And um, Bowlby, thank you. The Bowlby uh, family was actually retailing automobiles. Now, the problem with that is they weren't selling a lot. Because we had this thing called the national policy. Hands up everybody from high school history who remembers the national policy. <laughs> so long ago. So long ago. So long ago. So long ago. It was back in 1876. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> Sir John E. MacDonald set up the national policy to say we will have tariffs against American manufactured goods because we want manufactured items to be made here in Canada. And the only way to do it was to keep American manufacturers out. If you want to sell here, you're going to pay this big honking tariff just to discourage it. <clears throat> so in automobiles, it was 25%. Yeah. So Mr. Bowlby is adding, tacking on an additional 25% to the manufacturer's cost to sell in Canada. That's hugely discouraging. So a guy like McGregor was aware of all this. So he crossed the Detroit River in 1903 and talked to a guy by the name of Henry Ford. We don't know exactly when they talked or how many times they talked. We can kind of speculate about what they went through. Henry Ford, being a pretty smart guy, <coughs> was well aware that there was a Canadian market out there. A lot of farmers wanting to buy vehicles because transport on, in rural areas was very, very difficult. <laughs> and he knew from his experience as growing up on a farm himself that there was a huge market out there waiting to be tapped. And it wasn't going to be tapped if you had to add this huge tariff price to it. He also knew a few other things. He knew that McGregor was queued into the, the banking system in Canada, and through his pal Curry could access loans and uh, stock issue, stock, stocks being issued. Um, and furthermore, he knew that Lock Road at that point was a major processing center for metal products. Um, Canadian Bridge, um, Kerr Brass Industries. Um, we tend to it's all gone now, um, but Walker Road was considered the Manchester of Canada. Just one side to the other, Walker Road was just metal manufacturing industries. All gone now, I mean, I just can't, and this is a bit of an aside, but if you go down Walker Road, right by Wyandotte on the um, east side of the street, you can see what was the former entrance road to Canadian Bridge. And if you look at the gate, you've got the stylized bridge on it. But it can pass by a million times and not notice it. But there's a bridge there. <coughs> that's all that's left. That's all that's left. In those days, it was, it, was a, it was a huge thing because not only if you were starting up an uh, automotive industry, if you wanted to get parts to, uh, to subcontract out parts, these guys would pick up contracts on that in a moment, in a heartbeat. So Henry Ford knew all that. Now, he could have gone over to Canada and give it a shot, but why not have a local guy who seems to be plugged into what he needs to have do it? So he talked to Ford, to McGregor about this, and if they had some kind of deal where Ford could supply parts, parts had a tariff rate that was 10% or lower. You could assemble a car if you just could get a number of the parts, and your Additional cost to sell in Canada is now way below the 25% additional amount. You're really getting into the market. And any Americans who come into Canada, you're going to undercut them significantly. So, building a car in Windsor, Sandwich West, in a factory that Henry Ford can practically see from his own head office so he can keep an eye on things, sounds like a pretty good deal. Besides which, Henry Ford liked Gordon McGregor. He was pretty good at sizing people up. And he realized that McGregor was, although he really didn't know anything about mechanics, um, was a good salesman, and was a little bit hard around the edges, much like Henry Ford was himself. He was a bit of a tough guy. He could say no to people and he could really mean it. 
So Henry Ford liked that. He liked a bit of a, a not a pleasant person in others, at least the people he dealt with. He preferred his competitors to say, yes, Henry, we'll do exactly what you order us to do. That he liked. But in competitors, he didn't like that. So they reached a deal in 1904. He went for $125,000. If McGregor could raise that kind of funding, there would be an outfit called Ford of Canada, and he would be given all the Ford patents and access to their parts manufacturing. And that was apparently a real uphill climb, because young Gordon didn't have that kind of money. That was a huge amount of, that was a fortune to raise in 1904. At the end of the day, he went to Curry to raise some of it. He went to all of his family and friends, saying, please invest in my motor car company. Please, please, please. And uh, he's going through all, as imagine if your, your first cousin shows up at your front door, knocking your front door, asking for $5,000 for a $10,000, $20,000. Of course, the people who actually bought these shares ended up making a fortune. Nobody in 1904 knew that. It was all seemed like a huge amount of money that he wanted. And at some point, McGregor was simply going around the, the streets of Windsor, knocking on the doors, begging people to invest anything they could in his motor car company. But he did it. He got the money, and that was the big thing. He and Ford signed the documents to create the Ford Motor Company of Canada in 1904. Gordon McGregor, as secretary. Henry Ford, as vice president and they were off. What I like about it though is they're off in this little um, factory that used to make carriages, and carts and things. And basically that's what they're still doing. They're making carriages and trying to stick a, a motor engine on it so it'll drive. And you talk about a horseless carriage in 1900 from that point forward, that's basically what they were. I mean, nobody could really envisage a thing like a separate automobile. If you look at the the spoke wheels on those cars of those period, those are just carriages for horses with an engine stuck on them. Basically what they are. The factory has these wooden trestles where they would get chassis from Detroit, put them on the trestles, and a team of guys would scratch their heads and look at the how-to book and try and attach bumpers and things, stuff onto them, and then hope that they could hook it up to a transmission somehow. And they would work on each car individually. Each one was handmade. So it was all pretty rough and ready car manufacturing. By the end of 1904, they produced, Ford of Canada produced 26 cars. It's a start. Gordon McGregor would drive through the streets of Windsor on a Ford car. Haha, look, we made this one down, down the street in Sandwich, in Sandwich East Township. <coughs> so that was, they were off the ground and running. And they started manufacturing on their trestles and things on that factory, which is now unfortunately just a plain swath of grass at the foot of Riverside Drive and Drew Road. 1906, Henry Ford said, that's great, Gordon, but we've got to step it up on production. And he sent over a guy by the name of George Deckard, who was one of his chief uh, assembly engineers. And he took over the production there. And he really ramped up how the guys did things. <laughs> Get rid of the trestles. Uh, you guys are working on chassis. You guys are working on bumpers. You guys are working on transmissions. And started to get into the, mo the form of modern automation. And by 1906, the rate of production started to go up. They're now making at least six or 700 vehicles a year. 1909, the Model T hit. All of a sudden, you've got this one manufacturing car, which is rather easy to assemble once they finally got the hang of it and could be really mass produced. And furthermore, as they, the sales increased so much from Ford at Highland Park, the parts cost as they, got, as they came over to Windsor got lower and lower. They got cheaper to build and they started cutting the cost to the consumer. I mean, I, Wow, cost I'm not too familiar. There were somewhere over a thousand dollars about I think nineteen oh nine for a Model T, and by about nineteen twelve you can pick them up for six or seven hundred bucks. You think about buying something and the prices are going down. I mean, what an inducement for people to say, "I want to buy this thing," 
it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and it's a lot cheaper than any of Ford's uh, competitors. So what does Gordon McGregor do? Well, he's going to take advantage of this big time. Um, once again, he's a not that he knows much about mechanics of how to put cars together. He's a great salesman. He was selling collars and cuffs. Now he's selling cars. And for Ford of Canada, they've got the inside track because their bargain with Henry Ford is that the Canadian company can sell all of its vehicles across the British Empire with the exception of Britain. So that's a huge market across the world if they can reach it. And Gordon McGregor has said, I'm going to reach it. I'm not going to be content with selling cars in southern Ontario or out west to two of his big markets. Uh, he goes on a world tour. He leaves Windsor, goes to Australia, New Zealand, and his uh, method of doing this was to make sure he had with him a Model T. He'd go into some moderate-sized place in Australia, drive around in his Model T for a while, and then ask around and ask to see the who's the richest man in town. I want to give him a ride. And we can talk about the fact that I need somebody to be a Ford dealer here, Ford of Canada. And wow, the people wanted these cars. They were reliable, they were cheap, and uh, it was the kind of transportation people have been dying to get in places like Australia, where you've got a lot of set, uh, <clears throat> spread out. So it really takes off in Australia, New Zealand, India, and then South Africa, once again, hitting a country with a great rate of prosperity, and they love cars. And to this day, if you go into South Africa, into an automotive museum, and you see some of the old vehicles from the history of South Africa, and you look at those Model Ts, they were made just down the road over there. Yeah. Why not Britain? That was the deal. Um, Henry Ford wanted to hang on to a Britain. He was going to have a separate company right. do that. There would be a Ford, Ford UK. Right. Uh, no, that was part of the deal that Ford Canada yeah. could do that. Henry wanted to keep that to himself for the time being. So, oh, yeah. How did other companies make their cars? Where did they get the parts? Where did they manufacture uh, GMs, you make your cars, whatever? How did they make their cars, which weren't as good as that had to compete with Ford? You had their little factories all over the place. How did they make your cars? Well, a lot of them, <coughs> in, in due course, GM, Chrysler, Studebaker, um, would all come into um, Canada, mm -hmm. usually into Windsor, mm -hmm. because their parts assemblies are in Detroit as well, because they're getting cheap parts once again. Okay. The difference between getting a, a parts versus a <coughs> manufactured vehicle. So there, a lot of them are just importing parts manufactured in Detroit area, yeah. and imported the parts here, and then they become made in Canada parts to export to the world. Right. Basically, they they each have their little assembly plants here, right? Which was great for Canada because people were getting jobs and there was why the world producing. has so many things and why. Well, that predated the automotive industry. Well, when you became, um, in many ways. Walker had already had the metal manufacturing areas before then. Mm -hmm. um, like Studebaker came into um, um, Single Grove on that building, which is a home for seniors now. I, I love it. It's a, <laughs> that, built, that area was used to be gold manufacturing um, back in the 1870s. They were, were making sofas and chairs and stuff. And Studebaker bought that as a part of their factory. And they kept it up for a while because they used it for the upholstery, for the interior of their cars. In fact, they ran both things for a while. You could go to that place and buy a sofa or a car. And Studebaker made it clear by the 1930s when the Liberal <coughs> government was getting rid of the tariffs because people were complaining about the Midwest. And so you just buy American cars, cheaper American cars. They, they closed up their factory ones are just like that. Mm. We don't need Canada anymore. We're just going to build everything in the uh, in, uh, <clears throat> where Notre Dame is. Um, Pennsylvania? No, over there somewhere. That's in Indiana. Okay, over there somewhere. Uh, we'll, build, we'll build all the cars there. We don't need to, to build anything in Canada anymore. So once you got rid of the tariffs, you got the tariffs, you got rid of the manufacturing. 
So anyway, um, that's 1909, and Ford of Canada is taking off like a rocket. Um, we're now selling huge amounts of, of vehicles. <clears throat> and Mr. McGregor is getting to be very, very wealthy in the, in the process. Um, he's being looked at as one of the guys who's really done everything to make Windsor what it is, because the city's population is taking off. People are coming here in droves to work at this factory because they're hiring all kinds of people. It's, it's attracting, as you mentioned, uh, more car manufacturers to come here to take car, part of this. It's just simply uh, feeding on, it's like a fire, it's feeding on its own growth. Of course, there's no infrastructure to handle it all. Uh, it's growing so fast, there's no money for roads or schools or sewers. They're just building up all over the place. So that will be an ongoing problem for Windsor. As far as, Walter, as, far as Lord McGregor is concerned, um, he's becoming one of the wealthiest men in the country as a result of Ford of Canada, and certainly one of the most respected industrialists um, in this country. And people mention that at the time. When you think of Windsor in the, in the whole context of Canada. Uh, I, I thought it was remarkable. Uh, 1900, before all this began, put it in context, Windsor was a nothing really a city, technically, of about 10,000 people. <clears throat> and basically just an annex to Detroit. By 1929, when Ford of Canada's really hitting its boom, um, Windsor by that point, the, the metro area of all the border cities is over 100,000 people. It's the eighth, it's the tenth, eighth largest city in Canada, mm -hmm. the fourth largest industrial complex in the entire country. And all that happens almost just overnight. It's really incredible to look at. That's why writing this book, I'm just so taken aback by it. Um, that this, what an incredible period in our history, not only for Windsor, really, but for a phenomenal story in Canada. War breaks out, 1914, and Ford of Canada is making about 45,000 vehicles a year at that point. And uh, what do they contribute to the war effort? Uh, it wasn't done back then. Wars are fought by young men in cotton outfits. Um, it's not part of our business. Ford of Canada keeps on importing and using raw materials and metals, just like nothing happened, and employing people and churning out cars. Requi requirements for cars skyrocket still. They're up to about uh, $180,000 per year vehicles. 180,000 vehicles per year by the end of the war. They're making huge profits to the extent that they could caught in a law called the War Profiteers Act. And Ottawa requires uh, McGregor to make a huge payment as a war profiteer, which he simply very quietly does. Because <clears throat> for political reasons, and uh, you just don't want to read about that in the newspapers, about we made a huge amount of money during the course of the war, and by the way, we're fighting it, and we don't want to pay it. Uh, McGregor thought the most political thing to be just simply pay it and walk away. So that was that. So by the end of World War I, Ford of Canada has done very well, and Gordon McGregor is on. Um, certainly one of the, the foremost people in this community. He does not get a lot of time to enjoy it. Um, he suffers a mysterious ailment and um, appears not to be uh, able to treat it very well. Uh, to this day, they're not exactly sure what it was. He dies in 1922. Not a very old man. Uh, as a, it was a great shock to this community uh, that he was gone all of a sudden because he had been the one who suddenly brought Windsor from nowhere to make it one of the great manufacturing and industrial cities in the country. But just to kind of go full circle about the whole thing, uh, before his death, as I mentioned in 1917, Windsor had finally got it, or the provincial government had required Windsor to set up the Essex Border Utilities Commission to govern our utilities. And the question is, who's gonna run it? And there was almost a unanimous, well, unanimous public request that Gordon McGregor take over. As I mentioned, he never had any political inclinations and he never wanted to run for public office. Um, he just as well not see his name in the paper for the <coughs> um, He was requested to do it and he did it because 
Sometimes you should do things. Uh, you've done well in this world. You should give back once in a while. And he acted as chairman of the EBUC for several years. And it was really under his direction that, because he was such a, a great organizer and effective businessman, that the Utilities Commission came into its own with regard to uh, establishing an organized form of sanitary sewage and water in Windsor. So we have Gordon McGregor to thank for that as well. He never ran for office in this thing. Um, he simply said, if you want me to be a member of this commission, I will be. So every year, without fail, people in Windsor and Walkerville and Fort City voted for him to go on to it. So that's, that's what we have going forward. Of course, um, in 1922, Gordon McGregor's part of it comes to an end. Um, except for, of course, thereafter, Ford's was continued to innovate and they introduced the aluminum engine block and the aluminum chassis to end up with much lighter vehicles, which made them that much easier to push. <laughs> no, it just wouldn't go. <laughs> so thank you for that. That's what I have to say about Gordon McGregor. Any questions or anything? No. Yeah. Uh, when did they build Gordon McGregor School? I think that was after his death in the 1920s. Yeah. I mean, once again, a very revered figure. So we just kind of think of it as Gordon McGregor School, but it was really in recognition of uh, this guy's accomplishments and what he did for this community. And there is no McGregor Street in Windsor, as I know of. Is the hamlet outside huh? is named after him? I don't think so. I don't think it is. Different. And you're right, I don't think there is a McGregor. Is there a McGregor Street out there? I don't think it's true, but the hamlet's named after his father, isn't it? Could be. I believe because his father was a small time politician, right? He was a legislator of the legislation was, I think, for Lower Canada, or I think it was named in his honor, with the hamlet? It could have been, I, I'm not sure. I mean, okay. he was very active in the, uh, the horse trading and all that stuff, so he could have owned a lot of land out there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I was wondering about the uh, Ford pullout in uh, 54. Uh, was that a lot to do because of uh, labor activity uh, or more of a centralization to bring some up to the Toronto area or, or Oakville, I should say? That's who you talk to. I, I've kind of looked into that. Right. Um, in, there were a series of strikes in, in Ford, especially the major one in 1945. And there was a lot of labor unrest in the early 1950s as well. And to uh, some extent, Ford said, by the way, we, we want to centralize our production near the, the main market in Toronto. And a lot of the, the car companies were doing that. And uh, so there was that. But there was um, especially the fact that um, with the labor unrest in the early 1950s, the municipal and police would not do anything to enforce laws protecting property. And Especially about in 1953, there was one strike in which there was a major amount of damage done to the power plant. And the Windsor police simply sat there and watched. And the guys who were running for it were just, were just outraged. And there was a lot of comment about, we're going to move everything to a municipality where, where they will enforce the law. And so they moved vehicle assembly all to Oakville. But interestingly enough, they kept all the engine assembly in Windsor. Which was a major part of their operation. And then Trudeau helped bring the new plant uh, back in the 70s, I guess it was, or early 80s. Uh, the, the new plant? The, the, Ford, the other Ford plant. Too. I don't know. I, I, I remember they, they, uh, the feds gave them 200 million at the time. Uh, well, I remember Peter Davis telling me he thought it was all, pre, it was all what they did. Premier <laughs> Davis told me that, so it must be well, true. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good guy, one of the few good conservatives. Uh, uh, uh. And someone told me how much of this truth or lie that they moved the assembly plant in Oakville to the riding of the Premier. I don't know how much of a lie that is, but it sounds too good to be true. Yeah, I don't think that's true because there, there's no mention of it at the time. It's, it sounds too good to be true. It sounds like a lie. <laughs> Trafalgar Township is a great big open area. No, it, it was close enough. It was a, it was a big area. <coughs> they had everything they needed. Okay, because they needed a big empty piece of land yeah. near the market. Toronto was at the market. Toronto market, and it had railway, electricity, hydro, the whole bit. Okay. So the utilities were all there. 
when did they stop getting the parts from Detroit and actually making them here? Or did they continue to take the parts from Detroit to make the Fords here? I'm sure to this day they do. I mean, once again, there's a separate parts trade. It's a huge part of automotive production. And it's, it's all part of the tariff system, which is way beyond my intelligence of, with regard to how much tariffs are on parts versus uh, uh, assembled vehicles. Uh, for example, part of free trade, though. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no, no tax on parts. But my other thought is, when Ford left, ex uh, moved the, man, the assembly to all Oakville, he left behind a whole bunch of parts manufacturers in Windsor, which is why Windsor is very famous to be a parts manufacturing area. And the machine shops. All, all too. the big factories get their parts from Windsor, suburban, you know, oh. suburban Windsor. Oh, yeah. Lots and lots and lots of little small factories make parts for the car, the very, very sort of vehicles in the suburban London. Just, just answer, just to finish answering the question. Um, I was reading about China is now getting into the parts manufacturing for vehicles. And with Mexico, they've got a deal where China is providing a lot of the parts for vehicles under a certain limit because um, under NAFTA, you can only sell a vehicle, find vehicles with something like 70% of it have to be North American produced. So they have to be careful that they keep under that amount. So, for example, in China, they're not exporting vehicles, they're exporting parts to, to Mexico within limits. Okay. Um Well, I know in the, the first book I wrote about Windsor, I talked about the Currys to some extent. So you might find some information there unless you, you want me to check that out. Okay. About the, their banking and everything. Okay, and what what book was that? The River and the Land. I think there's a copy there. Okay. Um, just as a, an aside, John Curry, famous banker in the uh, 18, 1870s, 1880s in Windsor. Uh, once again, a leading figure in this community. Um, he had a mansion, because he was a big shot, at the corner of Olette Avenue and uh, uh, you know, where the library used to be. It's, oh, it's Ellis? 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 Or, Ellis or? or Elliot. 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 Um, which was purchased for the uh, hydro company. Oh, the oh, oh, side. Yeah. yeah. And they knocked it down. And they took over Mr. Curry's mansion and they knocked that down and they built the currently Windsor Utilities Commission. Oh. Except that the interior of it was very nice, extensive English wal walnut paneling. And that led to what? Well, the armories. Oh. The oh. officers' mess. Which is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Up on you know, the office the armories. Yeah. And of course now that the armories is not there anymore, they moved the whole military establishment out to Sandwich. They took that with them. Yes. So the interior of the officer's mess is still that wood family, uh -huh. which originally came from John Curry's mansion. Did Gordon McGregor have a wife or Oh no, no, he was married, had uh, had had children, um, and his son Walter McGregor, I think, was a fairly prominent individual. Um, he was in the Essex Scottish. The McGregor family. Had, can add this, um, because of their Scottish background, you might imagine from the name, mm -hmm. were very proud of that. And they were instrumental in founding the 241st uh, Highland Regiment here in Essex County in 1917. And Gordon McGregor's brother served as an officer in that regiment. And then afterwards, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the McGregor family was very prominent in keeping the local militia alive. And the founding of the Essex Scottish sometime in the early 1930s, the Essex Scottish Regiment, um, they donated to that. And Walter McGregor, who I think was his son, served as an officer in that regiment and was captured in Dieppe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought maybe I've got the wrong family here. Was that the family that donated the kilts? Yeah. And that, so that's what the plan that they have now right. to this day. 
is some McGregor uh, derivation. I think you're right with that, yes. Yeah, I, I, I close enough or not close, close enough or not close enough, I'm not buying it. So basically, McGregor's, I think, paid for the kills, and that's why they happen to this day. If I can throw in a little ad, too. Um, I've got, I've got a few copies of this for mere for mere ten dollars if you're looking for Christmas presents or something. It's just you want a stocking stuffer? This this is are you building? Yeah. Are you creating a, 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 a book of forty five more or less the present? Yes, I've been looking at that. And that's why you're talking to the publishers these days. They're not being as no, that's 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 something else. Okay, but another book from then to the present is under wrap. Yes, yeah. good. Well, my, my grandfather uh, was in World War One in the Canadian uh, Army, and he uh, worked at Ford's from right after World War One to 1957 uh, when he retired. But I guess my question was uh, about the CAW uh, at the time in the 60s and the 70s when the CAW actually had the better deal of trade uh, uh, with compared to the states, and then we lost that during NAFTA or FDA and then NAFTA. I wonder if you could mention about how the... Yeah. I, I know a little bit about this, maybe I'll know some more, but... Uh, by the 60s, the whole kind of trade issue, the complexion to it had changed because uh, we're making Monarchs and a few other vehicles like that in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and it became really impractical for Canada just to be making two or three models. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, the. the The car trading pack in the 1960s changed all that. It was a completely different deal at that point. But anyway, that's what we had to deal with in, in Gordon McGregor's time was the national policy of Sir John A. MacDonald. And uh, that's why we had all those car plants moving into Windsor. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.